have quite a bit of information to go through, but um, growing stone fruit, and stone fruit is pretty much everyone's favorite. I mean, there's mangoes and papayas I love too, but uh, I do like pretty much any of the stone fruit are excellent to eat. The challenges we have nowadays with stone fruit is that every single one of them requires a chill. So there is a term called the minimum says 300 hours or less, and an Inca about 270 hours or so. And what that means is when they're, come winter, uh, they need so many hundred hours of temperatures between, so the chill that plants get is not below freezing, it's actually, when it's, and it occurs with each bud on the branch. It's not the roots at all. It's the developing flower or leaf buds attached to these stems have to undergo a certain amount of cold in the winter to develop properly. And the temperature range for that is 34 degrees to about 55. Um, for some reason, the University of California uses an older model that says 34 to 45 which means if you go by that model, in the last few winters we've had, we've had no chill. Uh, a little more extensive model by several other colleges and by University of, I think it's Utah, says that there's less chill as you go toward 55, but there's still chill. And what they told us, you guys who seem to be smarter, is that chill is not like, uh, say, 30 degrees and 40 degrees and 50 degrees and 60 degrees. It's not something that looks like this. It's something that looks like this. So it's more of a curve rather than a straight line. You only get chill. You get one hour of chill for every hour you spend between 34 and 45. No. You get you start getting chill at around 34, you get maximum chill at about 45, and you get less and less chill as you hit the 55, and then it's kind of neutral to 60, then you lose chill when you get above 60, you lose a lot of chill if you get above 70 degrees. Uh, during, you know, say sometime between mid-November and mid-April, or until the end of winter, so. Probably the plant gets chill when nights are, short, are longer than the days. But uh, no one knows exactly what's going on. I mean, it's, it's all estimates. They're just trying to figure out how to explain what plants do. But we like the model that says, yeah, you get chill between 34 and 55 because it explains what happens on the coast. Because the coast doesn't get very cold, we have a lot of customers who get good crops right on the coast where it stays, you know, between 45 and 55 for long periods in the winter. They don't get too hot, they don't get too cold, but they get a lot of chill. So the chilling requirement, we think, follows the Utah model. Um, this year we had, we think, about 270 hours which is kind of below average, or average, like last year we got a little over 300, which would be more like normal. Uh, if, you came to, if you came to us in the 19, late 1980s, we're getting like 400 hours every year easily, 400 hours of chill. The early 80s though, 250, 200 hours of chill. We weren't getting enough. And what happens when they don't get enough to develop the buds properly is they don't wake up on time. So usually the trees, when they get their chill, when they receive enough chill before the buds develop, the next warm spell, so it's gotta be warm for them to wake up. Then they wake up and they, they flower, the buds flower, buds open, the leaves start growing, they do quite well. Well, if they don't get their chill and it warms up, they just sit around doing nothing and like, 2014, 2015, some of the warmest years I can recall ever, 
a lot of the trees that stood totally bare until August that year and finally put out like four or five leaves on each branch, which is maybe one tenth of what they normally would do, and survived the year just doing that. So they survived, they didn't die, but they sure didn't grow much. So we ended up throwing a lot of those away because the growth was so short on it, it wouldn't be worth keeping it for the next year. So lack of chill certainly affects their health uh, and their fruit production. No flowers at all when we don't get enough cold for them, or very little, few flowers when they don't get enough cold. So the chill is important. Now, one thing to know about chill is that cool air Settles. So now the air is colder, higher you go, you know, it makes sense because the air is thinner on a mountain than it is down here. So the temperature drops just due to the air density as you go on a mountain. So let's say at the base of, of uh, Mount Baldy in Redlands, which is maybe a thousand foot altitude, it may be 90 degrees. By the time you get to the top of Mount Baldy, it's only about uh, 70 or 75. And the air temperature drops just due to density alone, because temperature is a function of how many air molecules are hitting you per second. That's what makes you warm. It's just all this friction from the air molecules colliding with your body keeps you warm while the air gets thinner and thinner the higher you go, you get less collisions, and the air is colder just for that reason. So it's a Two degree, one degree drop every 200, 250 feet. I think it's 230, somewhere around there. Uh, you get one degree of temperature drop just due to density. But cold air does flow downhill. Cold air is thicker, denser than warm air, and it tends to flow where water flows. So in Orange County, yeah, if you're on top of Saddle that Mountain, you certainly uh, uh, are cooler up there at 5,000 feet. But the coldest areas in the winter tend to be the canyons nearby. The cold air just settles in those, or any riverbed, San Ana River, drains all the cold air from Saddle Oak Mountain and some of the base of the San Bernardino Mountains. All that cold air is coming down that riverbed out to the ocean. So anyone who lives along the San Ana River gets good chill. L.A. River, San Gabriel River, all the big major rivers, San Juan Creek. All those riverbeds get really good chill in the winter. Um, so the flat ground areas, you figure, should average, you know, 1980s, I was telling people 400 hours on the flat ground areas in Orange County. Lately, it's been, we're lucky to get 300 hours. So 300 hours on flat ground. If you live on some of the foothills, it may be 200 hours. Uh, if you live in the riverbed, to probably get about 400 plus. Even though we're all in Orange County, that's how it differs. And then if you get high on the mountains, then you get more chill too. But you got to be up well, well above 2,000 feet to get some of that good chill from being up high. Now the other thing that affects you is walls and buildings. So this building, let's say this is north, east. Southwest, the shade of the building also does a lot. So the, because we're so marginal, you know, we, we, we want 300 hours for a lot of fruit trees we carry. Um, and if we're only getting 270, the north side of the house may get 300, the south side may get 250, just because of the shade factor. The shade on the north side does cause it. So a lot of the high chill plants in my own yard, we've planted uh, on the north side about 10 feet off the north side of the, a two-story house. That's in the shade all winter. But the nice thing about most stone fruits, they ripen June, July, August, right when the sun's at its highest. So the sun hits them to ripen the fruit. But in the wintertime, it's totally shade, or shade most of the time, so they get more chill and in the summer they get enough sun to ripen the fruit. Uh, if you have a wall, north side of the wall versus south side of the wall, yeah, north side of the wall is better for the, uh, for the plants that need more chill. Now, if they don't need chill, it doesn't really matter. But generally, in most houses, you'd say, okay, you put your papayas and your mango trees and your citrus on the south side of, of, of 
objects and put your stone fruit and things in each shell, pears in each shell, too, on the north side. And that'll help you. And the east and the west are still better than the south. You get half the sun on those. So, as far as where to plant them, I mean, half the sun is adequate to get decent flavor. But you will get a little better quality if you have a whole day of sun. Now, east and west, even east and west side, as the trees get taller, usually their branches get more and more sunlight. So that can be a factor too. Although, what, what we know about cold air, uh, because cold air, you know, especially at the night, if there's no wind blowing, the air is much colder two foot off the ground than it is 10 foot off the ground. Because the cold air does drop to the dirt. So what we know now is the shorter you keep your stone fruit trees, the more productive they are. <clears throat> we get all this stuff that needs to be chilled down to here. You'll get more fruit than if it's up there. I mean, on the real cool winters at my house, because the top of the trees get more sunlight, the top branches are the most productive and have the best quality fruit. But if we have a marginal winter where we don't get enough cold, the only place they get fruit is the bottom branches because they have more chill than the top branches. So, so you see that quite often. A good winter chill, top is the best production. Uh, negligible chill or very low chill, the bottom branches give you a few fruit and that's it. So the so choosing your trees, choose the ones that have the lowest numbers that for the MCR, the minimum chill requirement, is better. The main problem being is that most of the plants, uh, varieties, or cultivars that taste the best have higher chill numbers. So it's almost always a, some kind of compromise between the two. In fact, one of the big problems we have is if you have a real low chill, like a there's some low chill peaches that require only about 100 hours of chill. So they, uh, many years, they wake up in December or January and the fruit ripens by April. Well, generally April is too cool and too, or too cloudy, or you know, if they ripen April, May, June, too cloudy to get enough sun on them and the fruit quality is not there. And in general, most of the high quality peaches ripen late June through July. Those are your best quality peaches and plums and, and things like that because the more sunlight and the more heat, the better they taste. So we do have some dilemmas when we're working with these as to which one to choose. The University of California actually <coughs> did a study on peaches back in the 70s at the Irvine Field Station real close to here, and they said the same thing. The most productive peaches were the lowest chill. The best quality peaches were the least productive. So. I mean, as they continue to develop more varieties of more cultivars, uh, peaches and plums, nectarines, all these, they are finding more uh, lower chill, high quality things. And that's going to have to continue in the future if we continue to get warmer, warmer winters. Although we'll see. I mean, the early 80s were extremely hot winters, and then the late 80s were really, really cool winters. Uh, so we might be going into the same thing again. I don't know if you get our email newsletters, but we talked about the solar minimum that's occurring right now that the astronomers say is going to cause uh, a mini ice age that may last 60, 70 years. And the only thing that might save us is global warming because the mini ice age is pretty much fatal to uh, half the world's population. So we'll see what happens uh, with this coming up. They said, what they say is the sun is at its lowest at level of activity they've seen since uh, the last ice age, which was six, 1600s, which lasted since the 1700s.
anyway, uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, size and pruning. So what they've determined over the last 20 years is the most productive size of a fruit tree in an orchard and the best shape tends to be a dome-shaped tree that's only five foot wide. That's the most productive size. And the reason for that is if you've got a nice full tree, now this one is only, say, half full because we came kind of close together in the nursery, but if you have a real full tree, the sunlight doesn't get very far into the foliage. So once you get beyond 30 inches, it's so dark in there, the production drops off severely in the middle of the tree. So if you have a, in the old days, they had 20-foot wide peach trees. Well, the productivity on the 20-foot wide peach tree was essentially this area of the tree, and the middle of this was not productive. So if you have a five-foot wide tree, the entire thing is productive. Of course, you have to plant more trees to fit that same area. You have to plant like five or six times more trees per acre to do what the single trees did before, but you get a heck of a lot more fruit on your property and quicker, because it takes like five or six years for this tree to be trained to that form, whereas these can do it by their second or third year, they're already in full production. So <laughs> most modern orchards, the trees are much smaller. And what that means for a homeowner too, you don't need as big an area. So instead of needing a 15, 20 foot wide area, you can put two trees, and you can keep narrower than five feet if you want. Uh, just hedge them against the wall, but uh, uh, Dave Wilson says three, but Three is a little tough to do. Uh, Dave Wilson happens to be our biggest supplier of fruit trees. And in fact, they're supposed to be the biggest supplier of fruit trees in the US. Uh, so they do a lot of research on this. But uh, five foot wide is a nice size for a fruit tree. And on a peach that's say five foot wide and say about seven foot tall, eight foot tall, that's about as high as you can reach, which is another goal of the orchards. Don't climb ladders. That takes too much time and effort safety issue too. Um, you can get on a five foot wide tree well over 100 fruit. Yes. Um, can you maybe help me? Okay, so I have three trees that are planted in like a high density formation. I think it's I think it's the one that's described on Dave Wilson's website. Can you explain maybe the shape of how that would need to be pruned relative to that five foot wide diagram that you have? Right, so Dave Wilson has a, uh, different methods of keeping trees small. One is just to plant them close together and keep them trimmed. Mm -hmm. Or the other one is for you, instead of planting single trees, you can plant up to five trees in the space of one tree. And each tree acts like one branch of this bigger tree. So that's another method. You can put five trees grouped together, say, 18 to 24 inches apart in the trunks, and they'll fight it out. They will use up one sector of the broom of this, say, this, say, 10 foot wide tree, 10 by 10 foot tree, and they'll take up one sector of that. Uh, so you have more varieties with less fruit on each, uh, you know, it's called cultivars, so that you can split your crop up and not have, you know, because if you have one tree that, say, eight, uh, 10 by 10, say, that's like 300 fruits, and most stone fruits ripen in two weeks. And there's no way anyone can eat 300, any family can eat 300 fruit in two weeks. So, I mean, when I had trees, I had a plum tree once that was 15 foot wide. It's like, okay, who am I giving to fruit to uh, this afternoon or this morning? Or who do I take it to? Because there's no way you can do it. So, they're saying, yeah, you can put five fruit trees in the space of one, plant them all in the same, within the same year, and they'll take up this room here, and they'll naturally, and, and, I, was, and I was intrigued, too. I put five peach trees together, and they pretty much stay in their own sector. They don't crisscross that much because in nature, you know, branches don't know they're part of one tree. They just head away from the next branch. That's their goal is to grow in a direction away from the shade so that when you plant five trees in the same hole, they all kind of head away from each other. They don't crisscross much at all. It's kind of uh, interesting. 
So that's one way of keeping the trees, each tree small, is just to group them like this, and, and they, they can't grow to the size of one tree. Or with this one, uh, they said do your heavy pruning in the summer. So you don't you don't prune this. What I'm hearing is you don't prune on the interior. You could still prune like in that formation, the interior. They just work it out. But yeah. you need to do the exterior a little bit. Right. So okay. the more the more dome shape your tree is, the more productive it is. No, no, no matter what the branch shape is inside, okay. the outside should be pretty much dome. Thank you. Now there, one of the problems we have is because now. Most fruit trees, and stone fruit definitely, fruit on second year wood. So the wood that grows this year, so this branch here, this green branch grew this year. This branch will fruit next year. But if you just leave alone, it will grow another two feet next year. And then this area becomes non-productive. So in other, in other words, to keep this tree productive, you've got to allow it to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, you can't stop. So you've got to get around that somehow, and the way you do that is you thin out the branches every winter. So like on this plum tree, they'll tell you, keep the branching at say 45 degree angle or less, and if it's too upright, it doesn't get enough sunlight on it, so they want to see the branches around 45 degrees or so, and in the winter time, make sure the branches are about a foot between branches. So anything in between, like this one's not, doesn't look as good, just clip it short. You don't have to take it all the way off, but clip it short. Um, so that there's room to grow new growth in here. And then the next year you thin it out again so there's more room to grow in the same area again. And you can maybe clip out the other the branch that had just fruited, clip that one short. They don't like to clip anything off, they like it to regrow. So if you clip it all the way to the trunk, it can't re sprout. If you just clip it short, it won't produce, but it can regrow in a different direction or the same direction. And you can you can change branches. So on peaches and nectarines, uh, they've done the most extensive work on peaches and nectarines. Uh, I mean, plums, apricots, they prune lightly in orchards. They pretty much just thin them out. But peaches and nectarines, what they found out is if you want to get a big peach or nectarine, you've got to make sure that, well, what they found is that the best fruit are on branches that naturally grow about one to two foot long. So this branch here would be pretty much an ideal branch to keep next year. It's about two foot long. So that can make your best quality peaches. This one is a little side branch, probably trim that off. A little short branch here, trim it short. So keep the branches that are, and they said the horizontal branches are the ones that get the most sunlight, they make the best quality fruit. So you want, so on a peach tree, pretty much, the goal is to have one, well, for homeowner. So in peach orchards, originally this, shaped tree, they had 16 vertical branches, and everything else on it was horizontal where the fruit was formed, but they had 16 essentially leaders on this tree. Uh, the modern peach orchards in California are down to sometimes just two leaders. They said they're working either with two or four, because they said it takes five years to create the 16 leader pattern. And the peach tree and nectarine tree they found are only at peak productivity until they're around 13 years of age. And then they drop off severely. I think actually it's only about 10 years of age. But by the 13th year, they've dropped off so badly, the miles have cut it down and start over again. So this took too long. This took five years to create. That's already half their best production years. So now they're working with this two or four liters. And in Canada, because the seeds were short, they're just working with one. They said this work with one liter, and I would say for a homeowner here, yeah, I'd work with just one. You get way too much food on even two, <laughs> you know, for yourself. So this work with one liter, one, so one vertical, I mean if you have two, it's no big deal. The tree has two vertical liters, that's just, you know, just work with that. But then everything else you want to be fairly horizontal and make the best fruit. 
and every winter you go and thin out and cut back the short or the wrong shape branches, they're going too vertical, they're going downwards, too short, too long, cut them short and leave on each side of the tree, you can say, okay, this tree has, say, eight sides. This side, front side, in between side, and you just say, on this side I want uh, the branches spaced about a foot apart, this side I want the branches spaced a foot apart going up the tree, so that you have enough room to grow new branches in there next year. So you'll have, on this coming year, you'll have this branch fruiting and growing longer, and this branch going back to this area. So the following winter, you can say, cut this one short and leave that one to fruit the following year. So you're just trading in the same zone here, you're just trading branches. Do you like mark the branches somehow so you can remember which one had fruit? Well, you'll know because they're bigger and longer than they have side branches on ours. These will be pretty much green stems that are all leaf, leaves to the base. I mean, you could mark them, but it's it's pretty should it's be pretty obvious. obvious yeah. What if I've already got five main branches going up? Work with those. Work with them. Don't eliminate some. Well, peaches, nectarines, and stone fruit in general don't seal wounds well. That's so peaches, nectarines. The reason why they're only productive for 13 years because they start developing too much dead wood. Uh, so they're supposed to be the worst ceiling tree known of all, you know, of all trees. Peaches, nectarines don't seal wounds, so if you prune them, essentially you're creating a dead zone in the trunk all the way to the roots. Signs that wound be dismayed. So if you cut off the big branches on a peach tree, you're gonna have a hollow peach tree really within a few years. It would be all dead inside. So the bigger the wounds you make, the worse it is. It's nice to always cut off branches that are only one or two years old if you're going to cut. But if you cut, the thicker the branch you cut, the more damage because it's a bigger branch. And they don't seal. So among trees, uh, birches don't seal well. Uh, aspen trees don't seal well. So most of the short lived trees don't seal their wounds well. Uh, they said the best sealing tree known happens to be a fruit tree too, apples. They said apples are really good at sealing wounds. So apple orchards have been in operation for 150 years. Peach orchards, 13. <laughs> 13. They used to keep going for 25, but when they did the statistics, they said fruit production is dropping off around near 10, and it doesn't make any sense to go beyond 13 for a commercial operation. Now they said if you don't prune a, fruit, a peach tree, you probably live 200 years. But because we want the better quality of fruit, you're limited. You're limited in time. So you're killing the tree as you're creating the better quality of fruit. So it's it's up to you how how long you want your tree to live, or how productive, or how the good quality you want to make on it. Um, so we used to trim our fruit trees real short in winter for our customers. We don't do that anymore because we'd rather work this method now than the old method where you cut it down at knee height and make it splay out and go outwards instead. But it is interesting. You see some modern orchards. All the trees look like a row of bees going down there. Pretty neat one. Okay, so on plums, and apricots, we don't do as much pruning. We thin out the branches now and then to make room for more branches in the same area. You can probably work it like a peach, but apparently you don't have to. Uh, plums and apricots both have a lot of short branches that develop good fruit quality in the interior. So a lot of those remain productive for a long time, rather than on a peach where you need it to grow one to two foot. Plums, uh, you don't need to grow very far. So you can work with the same branches for a longer period. Cherries, commercially, are already pruned, but the cherry trees aren't picked by hand. So, you know, they'll allow cherry trees in the orchard to go 30, 40 feet because they just shake them. So they 
put a big tarp around the trunk and then just shake the tree with the machine and the cherries all fall onto it. So you can, you know, but for a homeowner, yeah, it's nice to keep it clipped short, develop the drooping branches at a lower height. How many hours do the cherry eat? <laughs> Some need as little as 200. Oh, really? Yeah. So we're, we're certainly one of the hottest items was this cherry tree over there last, last year, or earlier this year. Is that new? Uh, fairly new, yeah, we'll talk about that. So pruning-wise, uh, again, try not to cut through too thick a, a branch because that does more damage to any stone fruit tree. It's better to do a lot of pruning when the tree is young and keep doing pruning on the younger branches, but try not to get the old ones. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, my neighbor had an apricot tree, and one year it just fell over, it was hollow. Even though it was productive up until the day it died, it just fell over and it was full of termites, and we thought, well, termites killed it. No, uh, termites in nature are not the bad guys, they're actually among the trees, they're the good guys, we don't want them in the house because, but, but termites do is they only eat dead wood. So they'll eat your house because it's dead. <laughs> but on a tree, they don't touch the living parts of the tree. They only eat the dead parts. So in nature, termites are considered um, essential to keep the tree alive as long as possible because if it's full of dead wood, the fungi get to it and it kills the tree. The fungus isn't doesn't recognize what's dead and alive. It'll just take the living stuff with it too. But the termites only eat the dead stuff. They're actually good for the forest. If you turn the forest and have termites, the trees will die a lot of things. This tree's already so tall. Would you turn it quite a bit, please, down when you plant it? Well, if you remember, it's, uh, one and a, it's over a foot higher than it should be because it's in a pod. Mm -hmm. So it would drop down to a decent height once you get the ground. But, yeah, you might want to just look at Put these a little shorter so you can develop a little bit lower head on it. I know I that's the only tree I bought in of this group resin we do ourselves. What is winter for us? Because it's so hot. <laughs> There's times at Christmas I wear shorts. Right. You know. Used to be cooler. Yeah. In the late 80s, uh, when we had about 400 hours of chill, I used to take my thermometer out at night and work in the garden at night. And late, from 86 to 1990, every night in December, January was in the 30s. Every single night. And we haven't seen that ever since. Ever since. But that's, I thought, boy, and that's when I first started gardening, I thought, you can grow anything. I had 12 <laughs> kinds of pears, 10 <laughs> kinds of plums. Uh, anything you wanted to grow, you can grow. So we were selling everything at the nursery in those days, that, you know, the incredible plums like Howard's Miracle, and uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of really incredible plums. And then the 1990s came, stopped selling all that stuff because it wouldn't bloom anymore. <laughs> it just stopped. But uh, yeah, so we might go back into that. We'll see. Because the early 80s were super hot, just like we're on right now. Okay, let's start with the uh, guys. Apricots have had the same problem, so the apricot would like 300 hours. It's about every apricot would like 300 hours of chill. Now it's interesting, I post used to own land in Lake Forest, um, and the property we were on was originally an apricot orchard in the 19 teens. They said El Toro was the apricot capital of California in the 19 teens. They were getting so many apricots, they were drying them and sending to the uh, soldiers in World War One. And the 1920s came, it got so warm, the apricot trees all failed to produce. They took them out and put orange orchards in, and the orange orchards were there when we moved onto the property in the 1960s. So that's the story of that area. So it was cold in 1910s too, and then it got hot again, and they all the apricots failed. So we've been going back and forth like this forever, so it's not anything that unusual. 
but apricots are my three hundred hours. We haven't had it recently. The apricot tree that seems to need the least amount of chill is tropical gold. Now we used to sell one called Royal, also known as Blenheim, from England, and that is considered the top of the line apricot. But this does need about you know, at least three hundred and fifty. Um, the, we sell tropical now, we sell gold kiss, and we sell flora gold. Gold kiss is about 300, flora gold is about 300, tropical maybe 280 or 270. So it's it's the lowest chill. Tropical gold, all that it is, is in a, uh, in a Royal Blenheim orchard in near Santa Barbara. A farmer found one branch and one tree that woke up two weeks earlier than the rest of the orchard and ripened two weeks earlier, so they cut it off and called it tropical. So it needed less winter, slightly less winter. And this seems to be the lowest chill apricot we can grow here. Although I have my suspicions about one called autumn oil. That may be. About 280 also, or even 270. But um, tropical never fails to wake up at the proper time in spring and make a few flowers and fruit. So even though it hasn't fruited super heavily, now last year wasn't bad, but all the warm winters it woke up and fruited lightly. Whereas gold kiss and flora gold, like this year, like especially 2014, 2015, wouldn't wake up until August those years. <laughs> Just stay dormant, stay dormant, looked at, finally put out a few leaves, grew a few inches, and then went, that was it. Uh, but tropical, woke up normal time, made a few fruit, didn't make a whole lot, but made a few, but grew normally. So we think tropical is lower chill. Now, autumn oil, I, I had been on autumn oil for about 10 years. It made a big crop every winter I had it. Every year I had it, it made a big crop. The problem with autumn oil is it ripens in August, and if it's anywhere near 100 degrees, the fruit just burns up on the tree before it ripens. So autumn oil may be an excellent one for the coast, where it doesn't get hot. But if you get a heat wave, you know, most apricots ripen late June, early July, before the heat strikes, generally. Uh, autumn oil, no way, it ripens during the middle or late summer, and the fruit is always cooked, and there's always worms in it, but it always makes a crop. So we're, I'm puzzled with this one, because the book says it needs over 300 hours of chill, but it never failed to put on a good size crop in my backyard, whereas my other apricots, gold kiss and stuff, they wouldn't do much at all some years. So we think autumn wall may be a good one by the coast, but not anywhere else. Then like the heat. But that's your apricots. <coughs> the fruit comes on the second year branches. Right. Yeah. So you can get a good crop on a second year tree. Yeah, uh, your selection gets worse and worse as the year goes on. Um, the one, tr well, the one tree that I would say is better is better root is cherry, because cherries don't like how hot the, the pots get. They're they're they seem to suffer the most in the summer when the black plastic heats up, whereas the other. Uh, some of the trees don't seem to be affected by the heat as badly, but cherry trees, uh, at our old store we were on, we had more land, we had the ground totally covered in black, on black plastic, net, uh, cloth, we block cloth, and it was asphalt, and when it got hot in the summertime, those cherry trees looked cooked. The other trees didn't suffer as bad, but the cherry trees, the leaves would just roll up, look cooked all the rest of the year. So I didn't like uh, what we were selling it toward the end of the year on cherries, whereas plums didn't seem to suffer from that as much, and peaches didn't seem to. 
But the cherries definitely have a heat issue, probably because they are from further north than the other trees. Uh, now we sell, these are the names of the ones that we sell, Mini Royal, Royal Crimson. That big one there is the Royal Crimson. Royal Lee. And Lapins. So all these can produce in the area. The, the chill on them is probably lowest here, highest here. This is the order which, in which they bloom, too. So many Royal blooms first. We think the chill on many Royal, the tag says 250 hours. Royal Lee says 252, but now it's more like uh, 275 or 280. Lapins, we're un totally unsure of. We think it's, we don't know what Lapins is. Uh, Lapins was developed in Canada. And when it first came out, so I grew Lapins 30 years ago by mistake, well, not by mistake. I had ordered a tree from Stark Brothers Nursery in Missouri. Cherry tree that said zone eight, and I thought zone eight, that's yeah, pretty close to zone ten. <laughs> zone eight is actually Sacramento and North. Uh, and it's called dark and delicious cherries. So I said, okay, well, let's plant my art. The thing produced cherries the second year, I had it, and produced cherries every year. I go call Dave Bolts and said, What's this tree that uh Starkings has sell has sold me that makes cherries here? And they said, Well, we sell all the cherry trees to Starkin Brothers Nursery. So it's one of these following four. Uh, so they, they sent me a Lapins, well, one of three, Craig's Crimson and Stella. They sent me those three because that's what they sell to Starkin Brothers Nursery to sell in their mail order capital pot. So I planted those three, and it was Lapins that produced the second year. And it's never missed a year. It always produces fruit. Uh, never produces that much, but always produces and always blooms. So, and the label said on their Lapin's tree, 700 hours of chill, which shouldn't produce here at all. But it's never, not missed, never missed here. So we think Lapin's is, uh, is less than 300 hours. I mean, this doesn't miss, but it never makes, it's never made more than a couple hundred. Whereas you look at my tree, Every spring, it's a ball of white. It says, this thing should be making a thousand fruit. And the book says it's self fertile. But I met some from Connecticut early this year. They said, oh, this isn't self fertile. So now, OK, we've got a clue. So Lapin seems to be a low chill cherry that needs a pollinator, like many Royal and Royal Lee. Now, Dave Wilson's claiming that Royal Crimson does need a pollinator, but I would be a little suspicious of that, too, now that we've seen what Lapin's now, it makes fruit by itself, but not that many. It's a roll of crimson. But anyway, the order of, of blooming. So many roll blooms first every year, and it seems to be pretty reliable on that. Roll crimson is supposed to bloom between the two. Now, we haven't seen roll crimson blooming. It's only its second year out. This is its second year, and the trees have not bloomed yet. Royal Lee seems to bloom about three to four weeks after many roll. So these two are supposed to pollinate each other. Without the cross pollination, they get very few fruit. But they're so far apart locally. You know, if you're in Fresno, they seem to be closer together, like two weeks apart here, three to four weeks between blooms. So that's why they brought out rolled crimson to split the difference. And then Lapin seems to bloom two weeks after the roll leaf. So I'm thinking these two would be ones that I'd like to go for because. These are considered higher quality than that one. I don't know what quality roll crimson is, but many roll seems to be a softer fleshed uh, cherry. Roll Lee is a firmer. They said this is like Bing, this is like uh, black tartarian. The Lapins is supposed to be like a Bing also. But these two, you know, Lapins is one of the commercial cherries that you buy at the supermarkets. Stella is a wonderful cherry, but this does have a chill of about 700 hours. They only got fruit on it one year, that really cool year, uh, 2008, where it didn't warm up until June. That, you know, we had uh, Craig Myrtle trees that wouldn't leaf out until June that year because it was so cool in the spring. And Stella that year, for me, made a couple hundred fruit, and they were excellent. But that's the only year it ever made anything. So Stella, uh, real 
high quality commercial cherry, not for our area unless you're in the canyon somewhere or in the mountains. But these are the four that we'll be selling. Right now we've got, uh, I think I might have a mini roll. I have this one roll crimson, and we have lots of lapins that we're out of the roll leaf. So bear root coming up in January, I've got all four of these coming. And how far apart do you need them? Well, get them close. If you want them to cross pollinate, they've got to be adjacent trees. So you know, five feet apart, three feet apart, 10 feet apart. So it's okay if they grow in the But I'm thinking Lappin's and Little Lee is a better pair, but you know they're saying any one of these three. Well, you, you have, if you get the roll crimson, then you you're covering these two, so you get either this one or that one. But roll Lee is the better quality cherry of the two. My, we've only we just moved over to orange, and there's different fruit trees in the back. One I think of a plant management tip, and it got tons of flowers, but it didn't produce any. So do they, do they need, normally need a plant leader? Some pollinators. So many are all only death need pollinators. These two will fruit without it, but the question is how much will they fruit without it? So they're partially self fertile where these don't seem to be very good at all without a pollinator. And the same thing happens with plants. There's some that are extremely self fertile and some that are not. That's your cherries. Cherries are the most susceptible to root rot of all the stone fruits. We need to have better drainage for cherry trees. We don't want them sitting in a, a low boggy spot. Uh, the the 1998 rains killed off my Stella and one of my Craig's Crimson. Well, in fact, killed all, all three of the cherry trees I planted in the early 90s. Uh, then we replanted the Lapins in a different spot. In fact, I lost every single cone in my yard from that real wet winter too. It took two years for them all to rot away, but they eventually all rotted and died from that. So you don't want them in a low spot where it stays underwater. Okay, um, nectarines. There are actually very few nectarines that do well here. There have always been very few. Um, we sell desert delights. from the 1970s and 80s. However, we haven't seen these fruit for a while because these need 300 hours of chill. Double light needs 300 hours of chill. Desert Delight needs 250 or 270. So Desert Delight did okay this year. Nothing else did. Uh, we had one fruit on a Double Delight. And the Panam and Snow Queen have just not done anything lately. So we're not even pushing. But those were our most popular and these are white nectarines. White, oh, this is yellow, this is uh, yellow, and that's it. Snow Queen is a white nectarine. Um, but they were the two most popular nectarines for there. Oh, there's another one, Arctic, Arctic Star. 300 hours also, and that's white. The problem with a lot of the low chill nectarines is they're ripening early. So this is, uh, I forget what this is, the light is now. I think it's early June. Because we know Arctic Star is mid-June. Uh, double light is early July. Snow Queen is late June. Panama is uh, mid-July. Uh, Panama has always been a mediocre flavored nectarine, so I never push it at all. 
It was really reliable for many, many years, but I rarely ever ate the fruit. They just weren't all that good. Arctic Star can be wonderful. Snow Queen can be really good too. Uh, Desert Delight, early June. So you're talking quality. You know, quality may not be as good as it could be because of the cloudy weather at that time. Delta Delight is supposed to be the, the best quality nectar wing we can grow here, but again, it's got the 300 hours of chill also. Now, there's one other thing that we can sell you that we're out of right now is the nectar plum. So this is the cross between a nectarine and a plum, but when you look at it, it's strictly a white nectarine with plum colored leaves. That's how it came out. And the nectar plum, nectarine plum hybrid is called Spice C. Till on it's around 275, and it is uh, mid-July. And it does have incredible flowers, good looking foliage, excellent flavor. So of all these, I would say spicy nectar plum fits the nectarine bill the best. So you can call it a white nectarine, ripens in uh, early July, so it gets the heat. Uh, flowers are a deep mauve pink, big. Foliage is purple when it starts out, changes to green as, as it Does it is. need a pollinator? No, no pollinators need to bring these. The problem with nectarines is they need the most spraying of any of the stone fruits. They have more problems than any of the stone fruits, although uh, pretty much most of it is organic that we can do. So with, with both peaches and nectarines, it is essential to hit them with a product. And I don't have this in stock. We don't, this is liquid cup. It's a copper spray that you spray them on when they're dormant in December. The reason we don't like to stock it too early is because it tends to crystallize in the jar within within a few years. So we don't want to have it on the shelf too long. The copper tends to crystallize out and it's no good anymore. But you spray liquid cop on the dormant tree sometime when they're dormant, usually late December. At least one time to stop peach leaf curl disease. So peach leaf curl, if you get it on a on an nectarine or peach. The first leaves that come out, come out really angry looking. They're all reddish, bubbly, blistery. Those leaves eventually fall off and replace with the new set. The tree wastes a lot of energy making a new set of leaves. Uh, by summer, you don't even notice that it was there, so you might forget about it. And then it does the same thing in the next year. So you have to spray the dormant buds with the liquid cup to cure uh, the peach leaf curl so it doesn't waste energy making new foliage. It doesn't usually affect the crop that badly, although it can start the fruit to that peach leaf curl. So commercially, they said that when you go to uh, Central Valley in the wintertime, it smells like sulfur in there. They're spraying their peach tree with, with uh, lime sulfur. Lime sulfur is supposed to be a little better than liquid cop, but they took it off the retail market. They said it's too dangerous for homeowners to handle, so they're not allowing us to use the best stuff anymore. The problem with liquid cop it is an acid, or with lime sulfur, it is a strong acid, so it can do damage to your eyeballs. Is it permanent eye damage? It's not good for, you know, they, they consider homeowners too stupid to handle dangerous things. So we're limited to liquid cop. That's the only thing available to homeowners right now. It works decently, so no big there. But a lot of stuff that they figure is too the homeowners too stupid to handle. They've taken they've taken away from us. So liquid cop spray it in uh, winter before it blooms. They say the most effective moment to spray it is as the buds are starting to show color. But be careful if it's raining during that time. You can't spray it, so it's better to spray it before. Then right when they're in bloom, hit it with uh, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew because. So this is for um, peach leaf curl disease. And when they're blooming, you gotta control the thrips. So in all the nectarines, and including the nectar plum, there's a bug that gets to the flowers that sucks on the, that kind of messes up the flower. I, I don't know if it's going after pollen or what inside the flower, but it scars the embryo of the nectarine. So as the nectarines develop, if the thrips have been in the flower, 
the least amount of damage would be a Nike swoosh going across it. But on the both on the spicy and the double light, double desert light, I've had damage so bad on those that you look at the food and go, it looks like a tumor you pulled out of somebody's body. It's <laughs> oozing sap, it doesn't look smooth at all. You don't even want to eat it. And this was back in the 90s when those fruit, fruit came out. And I asked Dave Olson, what can I spray on them to stop the thrips? Well, in, in the 90s, they did not have an organic spray to kill thrips. So I, I just pulled the trees. I said, I don't want to spray these with something toxic. So now that we have Captain Jack's done the brew, we spray it with that. Uh, it's organic and controlled the thrips. And then in the spring, it's nice to hit it one more time with Cap Jacks for the Oriental Fruit Bomb. So this damage you see here on the ends of the branches means I have Oriental Fruit Bomb. So it's a little caterpillar, a little tiny moth flies around, lays eggs. Four generations lay eggs on the new growth of the tree. It burrows in there, kills off the end inch or two. The tree doesn't it just regrows from down below. But the third generation in July will drill right down the stem into the fruit itself. So you pick your fruit, you don't see any damage, you take a bite, and there's a worm at the pit. And that's the real fruit bomb. So uh, if you look real carefully, you might see the whole drill right where the stem was attached, but it's real hard to see that. So, in the spring at least, you want to spray it for this oriental fruit moth so it doesn't get inside your teeth. Now, the first oriental fruit moth we saw in Orange County was in the 90s. In the 80s, our young peaches never saw one. Didn't know what people were talking about, but apparently we didn't grow enough peaches until the 90s, and suddenly, in my backyard, 75% of my peaches had worms in them, whereas none of them had them before that. So that was kind of a bummer that we got the, the fruit moth down from the Central Valley here, but this is what happens when you cook things that will grow. I have things that will grow and then eventually get the, the, the bugs with them. But uh, now you spray them once in the spring, control these uh, oral fruit moths, and that pretty much will keep out of your fruit. But still, you know, to this day, I'll cut my peaches open first, make sure there's no <laughs> surprise in the middle. They rarely get into, I've seen like one plum with the uh, fruit moth in it, maybe one apricot. They don't seem to get like those other fruits because of the timing uh, of them, or just the variety. We don't see that much damage on plums, apricots, pruots, uh, it's just peaches, nectarines, especially the ones that ripen in uh, July. July's the month. Uh, things ripen in June. It seems to be too early for the fruit moth to get into. So that's one advantage of the early ripeners is that they don't get worms, but anything that ripens in July can get worms. How often do you have to spray for the drips? Well, once when they're in bloom, try to hit them once when they're in full bloom. With my strawberries, they're still blooming, right? So do I have to keep spraying it every week or so? Or? Yeah. yeah, we spray the nursery every two weeks with cat jacks. Yeah. There's so many different things we have here, we just keep spraying. The Captain Jack's last two weeks on the plant, so we spray every two. I mean, you know, they say on the label, um, limited to six times per season. Well, that's every two weeks. Well, they say every two weeks. <laughs> now, for most things that you spray with Captain Jack's, you can eat it the next day. Uh, for apples and peaches, they tell you to wait, which I think is two weeks. Uh, I would say if you make a mistake and eat it, no big deal. Um, Spinal sad is uh, my dog's uh, flea pills. <laughs> so the dog eats the spinal sad, it kills the fleas on the outside of its body. Spinal sad is an ingredient found in rum, so apparently we've all drank it already anyway. <laughs> so it's not bad. Hopefully not that bad to have. Anyway, there's your nectar in. So we're kind of living on the good nectarines. I was spicy nectar plum is the single top selling stone fruit we sell. Because it is very nectarine, you know, it's essentially a nectarine. And it's probably the best one we can grow. 
for out of stock until next January. But I have a lot coming. We ordered 50 of them. Okay, peaches. Now we have some quite reliable peaches. Um, Order of ripening tropic snow from Florida is a white meat. Needs probably 200 hours or less of shell ripens in. And it can be anywhere from May to June. I'll put June. Because some years it ripens, some years that thing will bloom in December and it <laughs> ripens earlier. And then there's the. Um, Long Beach. This is yellow meat. It might even need less than 200 and it ripens in May. I got those reversed. I don't know. In my house, they ripen real close together, though. The Long Beach may be as low as 150. Real early. Now, we don't have any of these left this year, but there's Eva's Pride, yellow, I think it's about 250, and it's also around uh, May, I believe. I mean, some nurseries will sell the Florida peaches, other than Tropic Snow, they'll have Florida Prince, Early, Amber, there's a lot of them from Florida that are ripening in April. Early Grand, I think it's one of them. But they don't taste good. They're really, really early peaches. You know, in Florida by April, it's already 90 degrees. Uh, no clouds. So they get some, and same in Arizona. By April, it's already 80, 80 degrees. You know, perfect weather for ripening fruit. Here, it's just not that way. So I don't go for the rural early ones. And that's the most reliable peaches, but they're just too early. So we like peaches that have low chill but ripen late, which is always uh, uh, that's not easy to do. Let's see, Eva's Pride, and then there's Mid Pride. I think I have a few Mid Prides left. Yellow, I think it's 270. That's early July or late June. Well, it's the early summer. So mid pride is pretty darn good. Um, Peachy Keen, we think is going to be one of our top sellers. So it's interesting where some of these come from. Now, uh, Long Beach was found on the street in Long Beach. application, they have, a, they have a picture of the tree on a street in Long Beach. Well, Peachy King uh, was found by a gentleman named Mr. Chapman, found it just above the high water mark in the central coast of California on the beach. <laughs> so they're amazed at the flavor of this thing. So they started um, promoting it, and uh, Allie Cook picked it up, and were amazed at it too, because Peachy King uh, trees were left less than two years old on their property and had 100 peaches on each tree, averaging 100 peaches. On it. They said an incredibly heavy early producer. So Peachy King may become one of our best peaches. Alley Cook went out of business this year, uh, but Dave Wilson has picked it up. They said they like this thing too. They were amazed at what it could do. So Peachy King may become our top peach. Now, lately our top peach has been August Pride. My last August Pride. Uh, yellow meat seems to be about 250 hours, and it is late July into early August. And the folks at the that at the field station will tell you this is the best peach they think that they've uh, critiqued also over there. So you know, real big peaches. 
real good quality, you know, perfect firmness, sweetness, all that. They think this is the best one. Now, uh, 10 years ago, and for the, the ten, 20 years before that, it was Red Baron with our best peach. But it's about 300 hours, and it's the same time, late July. And Red Baron also had the advantage of being an incredible bloomer. Now, some of the Red Barons bloom in my neighborhood this year. When they bloom, it looks like one big giant red carnation. It's got flowers that are close to pure red, uh, and it'll bloom for like five, six weeks. I can't believe the flowers are put out. I was alerted to this in the 1980s by Robert Smouse, who was the yard writer for the LA Times. And he, he lived in Malibu, and he said, this thing, there's nothing wrong with it. It does the best of everything. And so the, we looked at the flowers, you go, there's no way this can make good fruit. It's got too good a flower show. And then the peaches ripened in late July. We go, no, this is awful good peach, too. So Red Baron for 20 years was our best peach. Uh, hopefully we'll get the chill it needs. Actually, the chill may be around 280 because they didn't bloom this year. And on the flat ground areas. So they, they did make a decent, no, I don't know how good the crop was. Red Baron was their best peach until August Pride showed up, showed it up the last two years. The August Pride that you have did that bloom? It did, but this is a first year treat from Fresno. So when we get stuff bare root from Fresno, it doesn't count because they already got their cold before they ever got down here. So, and I didn't have any leftovers from the year before. Now there's a few oddballs. Uh, there's the donut peach. We don't know what the chill is on donut. It's a white meat. It ripens uh, early July. And the fruit is shaped like a bagel. And usually about that big. There's one seed in the middle. So you just easily punch out the seed and then you have a little donut to flush there to eat. So we sell a lot of them. They, they seem to produce lightly and fairly reliably, but never I never had a real heavy crop on them. Um, donut is supposed to be the ancestor to the low chill peaches. So donut is famous in China. It was brought over to California. They developed uh, Babcock from it. I don't know, Babcock was their best selling peaches in the 1960s and these 300 over 300 hours of chills, you don't get more, but in the 1960s and 70s, that was our peach in the, that we used to sell. But Onita was developed from Babcock, and I believe August Pride is, is in that same lineage. So most, a lot of pieces were derived from donut. We have a new donut peach called uh, Posi Squirrel. So it's very similar, but it's got a little bit of red around the pit in the flesh. Uh, I don't know when it's supposed to ripen, but we think the chill on this one is about 270. Lower chill than the donut. We think donut may be around 300. Sazi squirrel seems to be lower because it blooms earlier. So we think Sazi squirrel may be a good replacement for the donut because essentially it's the same thing with a little more color in the flesh. Now, among the stone fruits, we haven't found a good dwarf one yet, genetically dwarf stone fruit. Um, Bonanza, which is the one that you see a lot, is all the, you know, all the literature says fruit quality is comparable to commercial peaches. It's like, oh, okay, that means it's pretty bad. <laughs> um, so all, most of the, um, pretty much all the genetically dwarf peaches, which eventually get tall anyway. I mean, uh, they start out a little short, but I had a honey babe peach, which was the best of the genetic dwarfs that I ever ate, but it needed 400 hours of chill. Uh, after about eight years, it was eight foot tall. So I had to start pruning it, so it didn't stay short forever. But bonanza, uh, uh, honey 
honey babe, and then I grew uh, southern rose peaches. Um, southern rose made a lot of peaches, but boy, they were terrible. So you can't find any quote naturally dwarf peach trees or nectarine trees or plum trees or apricots that worked. We tried them all. I mean, as they came out, we tried them. There was one dwarf plum that came down, never got fruit on it. We got an any apricot, never got fruit on it. So we just gave up on all those. They need more cold than they have. So this is, I think that's all the peaches we They promote Santa Barbara as requiring 300 hours of chill or less, but never did that well here. May pride can do well. We might be getting some May prides in the Anyway, so peach is pretty good quality. You can get a pretty nice peach. And the literature says uh, peaches are very reliable. If you get the chill, you'll get the fruit. Or as they say, plums, sometimes everything's right and nothing happens. Have you seen the um, donut nectarine? Not yet. I've, I've purchased some in the store. They were really good. Um, but I was wondering if that was something that I could get somewhere. I saved all the seeds. I don't know what will become of it. But. Yeah, who knows what will happen with the seeds. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's you know, that's how a lot of these things came about. That's how Beachy King was just something spit a seed out on the beach. And you got a tree, so you never know. You might, you know, it's fun to plan them. Yeah. But the chance of getting something better or as good or not yeah. great. <laughs> so. Okay, plums. So I was growing up, plums were my favorite fruit, but they do have their drawbacks. They most plums tend to turn into water blooms within a couple days after they're fully ripe. So you got to eat them fast, and they have to pick them fast too. The order of blooming on them seems to be beauty. Oops. Burgundy. Santa Rosa was always, and it still is the main one that other nurseries sell, but uh, my dad grew Santa Rosa's for 10 years, got one crop. I grew Santa Rosa's for 20 years, got two crops. You don't seem to get the cold, enough cold for it around many areas of the area. And if you live in a canyon, you will, or by the big rivers, you will. But Santa Rosa seems to need more than 300 hours of chill. And we just don't seem to get it reliably in most areas. <coughs> um, again though, if you're on, you know, I've always lived on a hill, that's my problem. I've lived on a hill for the last 20 years, um, but in the flat neighborhood in Orange, I've seen a Santa Rosa tree with fruit on it this year, so they, that flat area does help a lot. If you're on flat ground. Um, beauty needs only 250. But beauty does ripen in June, so that's its main problem. It ripens early, so the fall, even though beauty is considered an excellent plum in the Central Valley, because it's hotter earlier there, here it's, it can be a little washed out flavor that early in the year. Burgundy seems to be about 300 hours, maybe a little less than 300. Um, ripens in July. The burgundy, we've seen it do some awesome things, so that's still, the one I'd rather sell people, and it also seems to be the universal pollinator. Um, back 20 years ago, I mentioned Dave Wilson. This thing seems to pollinate a lot better than my Santa Rosa does in my area because my Santa Rosa really boom. And I noticed in their literature, they're using burgundy, they're listing burgundy more and more in their catalogs as, as the best pollinator for everything. And, uh, and we've seen burgundy bloom for as long as. Two months, maybe two and a half months. Um, 
back in the 80s when we had those cool winters, what my burgundy tree would do, I, I let my burgundy tree grow 15 foot tall, 8 foot wide, that was its natural shape. And what would happen is the bottom would bloom first, and the flower would just travel up the branches, and two months later, finish at the top. And the fruit would ripen starting at the bottom in June, and the top would finish ripening in September. And I was thinking, boy, this is a perfect plum tree. It ripens over three months. <laughs> and I was averaging about 10 plums a day during that entire time. But that, what the winters were doing back then is we'd get a frost, and then we'd warm up and get a frost, and warm up. The different levels of the tree were getting their uh, chill at different times. So I don't know if it will do it with the weather we've had lately, but it was, it was just amazing to me what was happening on that burgundy plum in those days and that I would get 10 plums a day for three months, whereas most of my plums would all ripen in two weeks. So, so the birdie, we still like it a lot. Uh, Satsuma seems to be a little lower chill, maybe 270, ripens in July. Some people love Satsuma. Uh, the book says it needs a pollinator, uh, but I've got some customers who don't plant any other plum because they don't like anything else. They just have that soon. They still tell me they get a good crop every year. So apparently it's self fertile enough. Uh, in my own yard, some years, that soon is the only one that makes food at all. So it's fairly low show, too. Inca's a new one. Uh, this one is a yellow flesh plum. It's not a new variety. I mean, Luther Burbank is interesting. Luther Burbank developed. Beauty, uh, Satsuma, Inca, Santa Rosa, back before 1920. Uh, he made his fortune because he developed the Burbank potato, which uh, became the McDonald's French fry potato. He kind of saved Ireland. He, he developed a potato that survived Ireland's misty weather. So he moved, he made his fortune back east, moved to California, bought up a lot of property around Santa Rosa. Sebastopol area and developed all these plum trees a long time ago. Santa Rosa, Inca. Inca is a yellow flesh. We think it needs around two, 280. That's an Inca there with a uh, few small fruit. A real small branch. The, the top of the tree was above the wall. We don't think it got enough chill, but behind the wall it got enough chill to, to get the flower from, but not enough light there to make it get reached peak quality, but they ripen in August, which is kind of a neat time of year for low chill fruit to ripen, it's in August. Green gauge, I haven't grown enough to tell you, but we actually got the fruit on our green gauges this year, so apparently it didn't need 300 hours. So 275, um, they ripened earlier, I don't call them green gauge right. Green gauge is actually European plum, Everything else here is a Japanese plum. But they is it green? Like. Yeah, it's kind of a greenish yellowish. Chartreuse improvement ripens. Green gauge. Mm -hmm. Tends to have more tartness in it. Which some people love. So these have been our best. And they all made pollinators? Um, the only one that says it does is that some of that group. Oh, Inca might need one too. When they first brought out, they said it was self fertile. There was a single tree in El Monte that was doing well. And then they backed off and says it might need a pollinator. But if you get burgundy, that pretty much pollinates anything. Right. Burgundy has again the longest bloom period of the plum. Now, what we're selling right now instead of the regular Santa Rosa is the weeping version. And a lot of the nurseries have stopped selling the regular Santa Rosa and gone to the weeping ones. So, as most plums, like the burgundy, goes straight up, the weeping Santa Rosa just does this. Now, all ours are tall because the grower stakes up the stems so that they'll get, they'll be on, not be on the ground. Because mm -hmm. otherwise,
why is they'll just grow like this on the ground. There's no way they can harvest them properly, so they stake them straight up to 10, 12 feet, and then when we get them, we just cut them to the height we want them to branch out, and they just arch over. And because of the, they don't know if it's because of the arching gets the branches lower ground, but they're saying the new Peak Santa Rosa tastes better than the original, and it's more productive in low chill areas. Maybe just due to the, the alone. How far should you keep that five feet as well, or do you get let that get bigger? That one you probably let because the it arch on bigger. it's about a five foot arch. Okay, so it can be ten feet. Yeah, if you keep it narrower, then it may not be. Okay. Now, I'll point out one thing that showing up on plums. Um, when they, when they don't have enough fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, then the leaves get red spots that fall out. So I didn't, this, since this tree is from last year, we usually, when we start our trees, put out a time release that lasts like six months or a year. But I forgot to do it on last year's tree. So all last year's trees we ran out of fertilizer and developed spots that turned out to be little holes. But they're not bug holes, these are just lack of nitrogen holes. The flu on the other hand, uh, the leaves tear in the wind, this, this flu out, tear in the wind real easily. They're, the leaves are made wrong, so I guess the hybridization of them causes some little problem. When should you fertilize? Pardon? When should you fertilize? Well, the ground you won't need it as much. In pots, uh, you have to keep them well fed. If when any of these trees run out of fertilizer and they develop red spots, then you might think is a fungus and the spots fall, fall out. But back in the 90s, we had so much trouble with that. I would, my dad had me in charge of the fruit trees, and we got every summer we got spots under apricots and peaches and plums and nectarines. So I would spray them for bugs and spray them for disease, none of that other work. And I said, let's just outgrow this problem and make them grow real fast. I threw fertilizer on them and it never happened again. It was just a fertilizer problem. It wasn't a bug or a disease. And everyone says shot hole. We thought it was shot hole fungus. No, it wasn't. It happened even though we sprayed them. But it stopped happening when we started fertilizing them. So it was just a fertilizer problem causing that. Now, I will mention, too, you do have to be careful with over fertilizing certain fruit trees. Nectarines are the worst. So nectarines, if you put too much nitrogen on a nectarine tree, the skin of the fruit doesn't mature, and what what happens is the fruit it starts to rot just as it starts to ripen. That's called brown rot, and it's due to too much nitrogen in the plant system. And they said one orchard had a problem uh, that they found to be too much nitrogen. They said it took three years for the nitrogen levels in that orchard to drop down to the point where they stopped getting brown rot. Too much nitrogen can be an issue for that for a nectar tree. So what trees in the ground are they one once a year? Um, well, all these trees once they reach uh, production size, this could a good mulch, nutritious mulch in there. You don't need to feed them that much. Yeah. I mean, I didn't see the spotty holes in the ground in my house at all. It's just in containers because fertilizer runs out the bottom too fast. How often do you water? Well, when they're dormant, you don't need to do anything, but uh, when they're in fruit production mode, we'll keep them well watered. Now, most farms, uh, most modern farms water daily. So, in all of agriculture, they found out that the more frequent you water, the more efficient the water. If you water infrequently, you've got to put on a lot more water to get the same results than if you water. You know, like in Israel, all they just do drip, drip, all day long, drip. Because <laughs> that is the most efficient way. You just keep the moisture level in the plant as even a line as you can, uh, and that's the best way to do it. In the Central Valley, they said in the old days, you know, after the winter rains, the water, the water, the ground would be soaked like four foot deep. It'd be really, really wet there. It rains more there than here. And then they would let it dry all the way to the top before they did their first irrigation. Well, now they said, that's all wrong. Uh, they 
they said uh, as soon as the rain stops, they start to water. Because they, the trees were looked a heck of a lot better and perform a lot better if they never allowed the soil to dry up that badly. So they said as soon as the rain stops, they start turning irrigation on. And too much water doesn't hurt unless you have a bad rain straw. Because they said the last couple years now, they've been this the water district has had a lot of the orchards watering way more than they need to just to get the water back into the water table. And that's how they do it. They said, you know, they have these spreading basins and the, they said there's not enough of them to get the water in. So they just tell the orchard, use this extra amount of water. We'll give it to you no charge. And the orchard doesn't use it. It just goes into the water table. They're replenishing the water table that way. So unless you have a drainage problem, too much water is not a problem. Unless you buy a tree from someone else and the soil rots the tree now. <laughs> so, so like this tree, we get it from Ottoman Sons. It's full of uh, groundnut wood. So this tree is capable of rotting if you keep it too wet. Whereas our trees don't have any rotting wood in them. So much less likely to rot out. But in clay soil, you can if the water sits there. So it's a matter of time. Yard, the last house I lived at, it was so bad clay. I mean, the developer, a friend of mine, was the guy who the geologist did my neighbor. Says we packed your ground with two foot of clay to so it wouldn't absorb any water. So don't even try digging a hole there. And so we were planting on top of the ground, and yeah, it wouldn't drain. It's one corner of the yard; it wouldn't drain at all. So when it rains, you know, the El Nino that 1998, the water just sat there in a pond till summer. And lost persimmons and cherries and plums because of that. If the water stagnates there that long, and then the oxygen level eventually drops too low, the roots suffocate and rot. But if the water drains fine, and as long as your tap water, tap water has enough oxygen in it, you're not going to drown your trees because the tap water itself has enough oxygen for you know, the, lives, the, the roots can live in tap water. It's got enough oxygen. In it. Now we get to the weird stuff. So back in before 1920, Luther Burbank told everybody, I have crossed an apricot and a plum tree, and no one believed it. Uh, couldn't be done. Apricots and plums don't cross. Turns out he actually did it. They checked the genetics on one of his trees. Yeah, he crossed an apricot and a plum. Well, now they do that a lot, and that's where they got aprons and fluos from crossing apricots and plums. Uh, Zyger Genetics, which is a family of breeders that lives in the Central Valley, they do most of that work, but they find they have to do what is called an embryo rescue. So they don't do anything exotic like shoot uh, weird uh, genes into the, to the genetic structure of these. They just take weird pairings, like they'll cross an apricot and a plum. And what happens is that usually that seed doesn't form right, but the embryo is developed. So on a, in, a, in a seed, there has to be, I can't remember how many times the, the male pollen has to cross with the, you know, the pollen has more than one male sperm in there. It's got several, and then, then the egg that forms the fruit, there's several eggs there too. Uh, some become the seed, and some become the embryo. So they said that from that weird pairing, a lot of times the seed doesn't form properly, but the embryo is there. It's half and half. So they have to do an embryo rescue. So what they do is they cross the flower pollen, and then right away, they after a few days, I don't know, is they open up that little flower, take out the embryo, and then you grow it in a petri dish. And that's how they're getting all this weird stuff, is the fruit never develops, the seed never develops, but the embryo has been crossed, and they can take the embryo out of there and grow it in a petri dish, see what it does. So we've got all these weird things. Uh, you know, the first one was plum cot, half plum, half apricot. Fruots are mostly plum, a little bit of apricot. Aprams are mostly apricot, a little bit of plum. Fleury 
is plum cherry. Cherum or pluri is mostly plum, a little bit of cherry, and then there's the cherums, which are mostly cherry, a little bit of plum. Piacotums, peach, apricot, cherry, and there's all these incredible things coming out down the pipeline now. Um, but you know, the pluots were the first ones we came across. Um, this is a dapple dandy pluot. Uh, real nice to look at too. But for some reason, the pluots are both sweeter than apricots or plums and stronger flavor. A lot of, there's some really dog ones too in there. But there are some ones that both are sweeter and uh, stronger flavor. So like this is the flavor king pluot that ripens in August. And flavor king is still a top rated well, probably the top rated food we can grow here. There is one nectarine that we've hired in Flavor King, but it's a nectarine that won't grow in this area. The Flavor King Pluot, uh, to us, it's always been like the perfect plum. Now, the chill on this is right around 300. So this year, uh, they didn't do much, and we only got one. We didn't get 300 hours. Our, uh, there was actually more of that on. I think someone picked them off. But um, what I mean by perfect plum, like plums, you only have like a two day window to pick them. If you pick them too early, they never ripen. If you pick them too late, they're already water balloons. So you have to pick them in a two day window, really. So I'd be up on my plum tree every day picking fruit that was ripe that day. The fluots, you can pick them like two weeks too early, they still ripen just fine. You can leave them on the tree for three weeks. They don't seem to get water blooming at all. So they're everything a store wants because stores have to throw away a lot of plums. They get water bloom light. So they like pluots. Unfortunately, I think they abuse them. So they pick them way too early and store them way too long. <laughs> so they're not as good as they would be if you grew them yourself. But still, uh, pluots are, are really good. So there's Flavor King. Uh, now, the apple supreme is one of the newest ones out, and that seems to be the lowest chill one that tastes good. So the apple supreme seems to be about 250 hours. Flavor King is August. The apple supreme is uh, early summer, late June, early July. So the apple supreme, which is crossed between the apple dandy and flavor supreme. Flavor supreme wouldn't grow very good for 10 years, never got a single fruit. But the Apple Supreme seems to do quite well for us. Uh, pretty darn good fruit. Not as good as Flavor King. And then Flavor Grenade. Which seems to be about maybe 280 to 300 right in September. And that fruit will hang on till almost till mid-October. Flavor grenade is uh, a little closer to apricots than most of the other fluots. It's kind of a tall fruit, yellow, pink, orange, uh, very firm. The uh, book says explosive flavor. I would say they're pretty correct on that. Yeah. So that's a good one. I do like that a lot too. I have grown the other fluots enough. There's flash. Which makes a few fruit every year. It never seems to be that heavy. Small yellow fruit, and we have emerald drop, which may turn out to be pretty good. This may be emerald drop here. It's a yellow, yellow fruit. They didn't label this at the store. They just have fruit on it. I used to grow flavorosis and geoprides, but they were not very good fruits. This looks like a. This actually looks like a geopride fruit. Kind of mediocre flavor, uh, not as good as the other ones. So we, so these are the ones that we generally carry. Splash, I'll, I'll probably stop. I just don't know enough about it. Emerald Drop has some potential, and these three are the ones that we usually recommend, along with the Burgundy Pump. Now these three may pollinate each other. Uh, the book says that. Uh, 
Flavor King can do, no, Flavor Rain can do Flavor King without the reverse, so you need to get another one in there. So you get three or more blue watts together, or this got a burgundy plum to go with the group, then uh, you should get some pollination. But yeah, I remember watching the leaves emerging on my blue watt tree on a windy day in May, and all the leaves had holes in them. It's just the way they're built. They seem to have three creases in them. And when the wind hits them hard, they just get old and it's real funny. It's like, the customers keep complaining, oh, you got bugs in your tree. I said, no, <laughs> it's just the way the pullouts are. Just watch the leaves get holes as the wind hits them. So, some, some defect in the pullouts. I'm sure they'll come out with more soon. But these three are top ones. Um, then you have the eight rims. Um, Flavor Delight's been around a long time. To me, it wasn't much better than an apricot, so I'm not going to push it much, 300 hours. But the cotton candy is a lot of people's favorite. <laughs> on one of our younger trees that come down from Fresno and it was excellent fruit. So people have raved to me about their cotton candy apron, very perfumey flavor. We have a Leacott apron um, that may not produce fall here. There's another one called Summer Delight, which may not produce here, but, but a lot of people live in the lower areas or are buying from us to try when they want to try all the different ones. But cotton candy may be the best of the apron sold out for this year, well, we've got uh, at least 10 orders for next year. If you want the Royal Crimson Cherry or the Cotton Candy Aprium or the, the few others that are really uh, sold out already, we'll order sometime in October. Last year we sold out a lot of stuff before November. You know the trees don't come until January. We'll have our um, price list and uh, we'll start taking over probably late September. A lot of the stuff we have is, like we ordered uh, 20 of these uh, Royal Crimson Cherries. They guaranteed 10. It said 10 more are subject to availability. So, so that happens a lot. Last year we ordered 30 and still got 10. <laughs> so, didn't help though, we'll order more until they have enough to sell you. Then we have the pooleries. We have two of them right now Sweet Treat. Sweet treat, the chill on that seems to be about 150. That thing is super low chill. I mean, the, the last five years we've had it, it's like the first thing to bloom every year, it's just a ball of white. Um, we finally had a pollinator around for our sweet treat sister. We had them blooming next to Flavor King Pluots. We had the Inca plums nearby and Green Beach plums nearby. And we had one sweet tree that was about this big, load up. It had like 200 fruit growing on it. I couldn't believe how much fruit was on that tree. So they taste um, a little better than plum. I wouldn't say they're that cherry-like. They were good, but super low chill. Now the candy heart, uh, none of our trees produced here. I didn't have anything old enough, but our customer brought me some in from his yard. He was raving about them, and I ate them, and they definitely have a cherry zing to them. They have a cherry sweetness, flavor, texture, uh, and they're bigger than a cherry by about double. So the candy heart may become a really good one, but we don't know what the chill on that one is yet. Um, how low it is. Sweet treat, even Dave Wilson sales rep thinks it does not have any chill at all. 
What's a good pump. pollinator for? Uh, well, I would say burning pump is still the best okay. one to have. So just have one of those. You're going to have to use it, basically. Because uh, we didn't have a burning from last year here at the nursery. Oh, yeah. But it was moving alongside with everything else. Everything else tend to bloom really late this year because we had that late I mean, March was our winter this year. In fact, Dave Wilson told me uh, this was such a weird year. They hit 17 degrees in March. They've never seen it that cold in March. So all the, they said all the trees in the Central Valley were six weeks behind schedule as far as food production goes. So everything they said is coming to markets late. And they might have had a bad crop too because of that early heat wave. <laughs> so. How do you, how close do you need to be? Like if you have a burgundy plum, how far will that pollinate? As close as you can. Now, it's easy to grab branches of plums on to us and vice versa. So if it's not <laughs> really? real close, you need to, we can always show you how to grab okay. them. You do it in January or February. So you just have one branch from like a burgundy plum, and then right. that would call it, that'd be enough to pollinate it. Otherwise, they should be fairly close. I mean, like adjacent trees. So one burgundy plum is only going to pollinate yeah, so the one say, right next to it. Right. So you have a burgundy plum, and then you have your pluries and pullouts all around. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> around it, because they, uh, even though they said bees will. Falling up to 25 foot away, they said in practical use. When you see the bees going, like the apple orchards were complaining because they had, what they had done is they had planted alternate rows of different apple varieties to get the pollination done, but they had to change that because they say they're watching the bees, they just go down the row. They don't cross to the next row, they just go, the closest flowers on the same row, they just went down the row. So they have to put the pollinators in the same row. They can't put them the next row over because the bees don't go that way. They go to the next, the closest thing they can get to. So, so they've got to be close, or, or just grab, grab them off. So this is a sweet creek fluory. It still looks like plums. Not much cherry in there. Yes. The um, pruning information that we were talking about in the beginning of class that was specific to nectar and uh, peach. Is that right? Or yeah, does but that it, also apply it kind of well? applies to all of them. You want, if you want to keep them the same size, then you've got to make room for the new growth to come. So the same theme kind of. So the more horizontal your branches, the more productive they are, the more vertical they are, the less productive they are. So it's nice not to be too many of this or you know, one up and more out. Although plums, they said, you know, 45 degrees seems to be good enough. Sideways. Now there's a few other pests that we've come across this summer. We had lots of mildew on our apricots in June. The heat cured that. And you spray oil on them if you want to control neem oil for the mildew. And then lately we had a real bad spider mite attack across the entire nursery. So spider mites like hot dry weather. So we just spray oil in the whole nursery to stop that. So keep an eye out for those things. Oil is considered uh, uh, organic and neem oil is too. A little damage on the peach leaves from the spider mites. But we caught that in time. Okay, I think that's everything. We haven't seen a cherum yet. So someone gave me some cherum from this. So a lot of crops that are created uh, head for the commercial orchards first before the homeowners can get them. And they're often there 10 years before we can pick them up. Like sumo tan greens, we can't get uh, Ambrosia apples, no, can't find those. So the orchards have an exclusive on them for quite a while before our homeowners whatever they like. So cherum is one of them. Although I didn't think the cherum was all of that interesting, but the name sounds good. Cherry plum. <laughs> okay. 
think so. All our stone fruits this week are 33% off. And we're done. Thank you.